Here we go. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, and welcome to the full presentation section of IDEC. My name is Ruth Kraft. I'm the Uber judge for this section of the competition. In real life, I'm a partner in a law firm in New York, and I was previously a judge for 14. I'm actually an Uber judge. And um, my specialty is labor and employment, by the way, so I'm very excited about your subject matter. Um, and we have uh, we have three judges here today, in addition to me, and I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves. Mm -hmm. I've been doing the IBEC for 21 years. So it's my labor of love. Kevin, you wanna go next and introduce yourself? <laughs> Sure. Thank you, Ruth. My name is Kevin Anthony. I'm a retired professor. I was the department chair for the hotel restaurant program at College of the Canyons. And I am, um, I've also was the director of our Institute of Ethics, Law and Public Policy up at um, COC. And I think what really qualifies me to sit on the judge uh, on this panel is that I have also uh, coached two teams in this competition. And I realize with all that you've got to do with your studies, um, <clears throat> how, how much more you have to put into this to make this work. So I want to commend you to start with. And I would just have to say that you'll find that your investment of time on this is going to be well worth it. So congratulations to all of you for, for uh, stepping outside your comfort zone. And, and I have to say, you see, we don't let people leave IBEC. So you guys graduate, and one of the great joys of IBEC is when we have participants return as judges, and it's very exciting. And in the last session as well, we had Kevra, Kevin and Samra Asagil from the Middle Eastern Technical University, both of whom coached teams for many years and are now back as judges um, post-retirement. So that's kind of neat. You know, we're cradled to grave here, undergraduates all the way through. Okay, and Leon, Leon Goldman, my name is Leon Goldman. I'm a member of the advisory board for the Hoffman Center for Business Ethics at Bentley University in Massachusetts. I mean, was I retired as the chief compliance and privacy officer for the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. And prior to that was associate professor of surgery and a practicing surgeon and acting chairman of the Department of Surgery at the Beth Israel Hospital. I am so impressed. Medicine and ethics. My husband's a surgeon, Leon. And of course, Bentley is one of the preeminent um, programs in the country. And certainly Beth, Beth Israel. What can you say about Beth Israel? And we also and we also have Bobby Kip. Hi, everybody. And don't worry, Paulette and team, this doesn't count towards your time. So don't no, worry about no, that. No, no, no. I'll <laughs> let you know in the box. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> my name, my name's Bobby Kip, and I'm a retired partner from Pricewaterhouse Coopers, also on the advisory board at Bentley and been doing IBEC for 20 or so years. I had the great honor of yeah, being the first ethics and business conduct leader for PwC, um, actually for the public accounting profession. And full disclosure, I'm a UMass alum, but it was ah. I, grad I graduated Woo! long before you guys were even born. So hey, <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't we all? Didn't didn't we all? And I should say that I started out my career after being a lawyer, tax lawyer at Wild Angel Manages. I created the business ethics and corporate social responsibility curriculum for what's now the NYU Stern School of Business and taught at the business school, the medical school and the law school. So I think we've got all the professions covered here, frankly. So mm -hmm. let me read the introduction here so that we know where we stand and then we'll get started. So in this part of the competition, the full presentation, you are taking on a fictitious I should say a fictional, not fictitious, business identity and assigning a fictional business identity to us as the judges. So make sure that all of us know who all of you are and who we are before we get started. You have 25 minutes, as you noted, with a five minute cushion to describe the legal, financial and ethical dimensions of the problem you've created and to recommend a solution that passes muster on all three counts talk for 25 minutes uninterrupted. Believe me, that's a challenge for me. We are then going to ask you questions for up to 20 minutes. And if we have time, we are then going to go through um, a little bit of review afterwards and some feedback. When we do the feedback, we're not role playing anymore. We get to be ourselves. And um, I want to give you some important um, criteria, things to keep in mind. Obviously, this is a business ethics case competition, so the ethical issues are the most important part. However, 
they need to be described in simple, practical, common sense terminology. Using technical philosophical terminology or basing your arguments on religious or theological grounds is considered to be a serious weakness in this presentation. During the presentation, every member of the team must have some sort of a speaking role. And if I can get my, you know, when we were live, we had these timers, which were the bane of my existence, I have to tell you, um, because they never worked properly. But it is now 4.09 p.m. and you can begin. All right. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if everybody can see the screen, yep, all set, yes. okay. and presentation. Wonderful. So, uh, like I said, good afternoon, everybody. We're so happy to be able to sit down with you all and talk about bringing a new approach for Starbucks and for unions. Um, so, we are the Eisenberg Innovation Consultants, and this is our team. My name is Paulette Palomares. My name is Fiona Herskovich. My name is Madhav Garva. And my name is Sophia Roselli. And so, to dive in real quick, so let's talk a little bit about Starbucks. We're really happy to be able to sit down with you and talk about the your talk to you, the executive suite and board, uh, that including CEO uh, Narasingham and then the executive suite and board of directors. We also want to take note as for your stakeholders, which are your partners, which is both nationwide as well as national, your customers, your community, and your shareholders. And so. It, you do have this duty of creating value for your investors and the recommendations we will be talking to you about today will take into account how to create value for everybody we have listed here. So let's dive into our agenda for today. Now, we're gonna start by talking about the ethical question and then we will give a preliminary recommendation and reasoning of what we will be talking about and what we will be saying. We're going to do a quick brief history of unions and labor law, as well as history of Starbucks and unionization to give some context, followed by the company's response. And then we'll do a deep dive into your consumer demographics, as well as then go into a detailed approach for our recommendations, following and ending off with a presentation summary. So from here on out, I will be passing it on to my colleague, Fiona Herskovich. Thank you so much, Paulette. Beginning in Buffalo, New York in late 2021, Starbucks has faced a growing number of unionization efforts amongst their U.S. cafes. It is important to note that Starbucks is one of the many companies, including Trader Joe's, Amazon, and Apple, that are each facing a similar set of demands from their employees, better pay, better benefits, and better health and safety measures. Today, we are here to discuss how Starbucks should approach the unionization efforts of their employees. How we approach this question presents an opportunity for Starbucks to set the stage as a replicable leader in the service industry. Yeah. Starbucks was founded with the intent to inspire and nurture the human spirit. When applying management principles to this mission statement, we can see Starbucks's dedication to the concept of flourishing, an ethical value a corporation has to promote the well-being of their employees as both professionals and as people. However, as unionization attempts have increased across the nation, Starbucks has compromised the values of flourishing with defensive actions against employees. The company has closed stores, denied benefits, and recruited intensive legal support to combat unionization attempts. While a flourishing workplace requires positive emotions, engagement, relationships, meetings, and achievement to come to fruition, unions themselves also pose harm to Starbucks's mission. The engagement that arises from unions is often divisive and can cause communication between a company and their employees to reach a stalemate. The answer to how Starbucks should approach unionization, keeping in mind their cultural values, lies somewhere in the middle between these two extremes. To foster a flourishing workplace environment, Starbucks has to recommit itself to creating a culture of belonging. Next slide. What this means in practice is making decisions with empathy, empowerment, and exceptionality as guiding principles. This means approaching unionization with an understanding that employees are seeking benefits to support their livelihood that will enable them to excel as both people and professionals. If Starbucks can keep these three E's as a focal point of their decision-making, the company can arrive at a solution that is ethically, financially, and legally viable. I'm now going to pass it off to my colleague, Sophia, to discuss an introduction to our recommendations. Thank you, Fiona. So in order to answer the question of how we are going to address these unionization efforts, we need to return back to the culture of belonging. And we recommend you do this through the three E's that Fiona just mentioned, 
of empathy, empowerment, and exceptionality. In addition, we need to honor authenticity. This is important from an internal and external perspective. Internally, the majority of your baristas belong to the millennial and Gen Z age demographic. In addition, externally, this same group represents the majority of your consumers. Therefore, in order to cater to their expectations and keep relationships well, we need to focus on honor and authenticity and transparency. And lastly, let's do what you do best. Let's make a drink. Inside later in our presentation, we are going to give you a detailed approach that will consider what you're already doing and how we can build upon this to reach new heights. Now, let's talk about who's at stake. Who does this culture directly impact? Meet Jen, our NYC Starbucks barista. Jen's per hour salary is $14.47. Her one bedroom monthly rent is $1,954. And her tuition to study film at NYU Tisch is $78,702. Across the board, Starbucks and baristas serve 60 million customers per week and 4 million cups of coffee per day. In addition, there are 503 cups of coffee prepared per shift. Now, being a barista, there's going to be hectic shifts from here and there. However, we've seen across the board that some of these hectic shifts have turned into problematic work, working conditions. As you can see featured here in these comments made by Starbucks baristas that one store was forced to work in a foot of water as a pipe burst, and another one in Texas had to keep working with a tornado down the street. Now, these are important concerns to keep in mind. However, the overarching concern we've seen across the board at all Starbucks stores is TikTok drinks. These drinks include outrageous requests, such as 32 scoops of vanilla bean power, powder or a venti caramel ribbon crunch frappuccino with 11 pumps of frapp roast made with heavy whipping cream, 10 pumps of dark caramel, five pumps of mocha, and six pumps of toffee nut. Now this sounds outrageous to say, and it is just as outrageous to make, and it also takes exceptionally longer than a traditional drink. Therefore, we need to pay attention to these concerns when we are moving back to our culture of belonging. I'm now going to pass it off back to my colleague, Fiona, to talk about a brief history of unions and labor law. Thank you so much, Sophia. So unionization finds its origins in 1774, when a group of Pennsylvania cords wainers spoke up about the benefits of craftsmanship over manufactured goods. Since then, unionization has sought to protect laborers across industries by giving them a voice, oftentimes a violent one, to rival powerful companies. Throughout the Industrial Revolution, unions fought against the ugly of the Gilded Age, eventually winning the 40-hour work week and achieving a legal end to child labor through the passing of the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act. Holistically, unions have delivered five clear benefits to workers. In addition to balancing market power, unions have managed to shrink the racial wage gap, improve non-wage benefits, and reduce economic inequality. Most notably, unions have also achieved an increase in wages. All of these benefits are highly appealing to Starbucks workers who are seeking higher pay, reliable scheduling, and healthcare coverage for all. However, there are critical union shortcomings for workers that should be considered as part of Starbucks's approach to unionization. In order to become a part of a union, employees will need to give up one to 2% of their salaries and will need to also face uncertainty of contract renewal every three years, as well as potential decertification of the union as a whole. While these two elements of unions are not prevalent issues for unions with long-term employees, such as teachers, the average Starbucks employee spends three to four years at the company, which may cause a lack of commitment and interest in unions, and perhaps even some apprehension, as these new employees may not be able to fully reap the benefits of an unstable collective bargaining agreement, but they are expected to support it through their salaries. With this insight, we can introduce these two statistics regarding labor support today. In 2023, we are at one of the lowest rates of union membership, but we have one of the highest rates of union support. This latter statistic is related to the rising millennial workforce, which honors authenticity and fairness in employers. The impact of unionization on Starbucks is threefold. The company will most likely see an increase in labor costs due to high wage demands. 
Additionally, if a contract were to be signed, Starbucks will lose the ability to adjust benefits, which could further compromise the responsiveness of Starbucks to your employees. In the same vein, the culture of belonging that Starbucks hopes to foster through empathy, empowerment, and exceptionality may be harder to achieve with a union presence placing a divide between your partners and the company as a whole. I am now going to pass it off to Paulette in order to discuss the history of Starbucks and unionization. Thank you, Fiona. And so let's go back a little bit. And so Starbucks was founded by Jerry Baldwin, Gordon Bowker, and Sev Siegel, with the first store being iconic, being in the iconic Pike Place Market in Seattle in 1971. And that's where Howard Schultz eventually discovered Starbucks, fell in love with it. And so he was head of marketing for a little bit of time until he left and just to, in a few years afterwards, come back and buy Starbucks to combine it with a company he had also started. And it's important to also take note that a part of this history also involves that your support to employees is central to your company as well as to your culture. As you can see here, we have examples such as health benefits, education, and other programs you have put into place. So it's important to remember that Starbucks is a leader and has been a leader and continues to be in employee benefits. But with the new generation coming into the workforce, this preference for benefits can change and we can have new, new requests for what they are looking for. This is going to, this is starting to show with how, like I said, a new workforce generation is coming, uh, a new generation is coming into the workforce as we got this, we got started with an unionization for December 9th, 2021 in Elmwood, Buffalo with the Starbucks location. So despite this history of supporting your workers and employees, your employees in general, baristas at various locations have started to have these concerns regarding pay and work hours, which as a result, they have started to feel like they are not being addressed and hence the unionization. Within about a year and a half, we are starting to see that there are already 300 union um, stores that have unionized. And, and within this time, we also are seeing that there is not a single contract that has been made. So this does suggest that your anti-unionization efforts are being successful in at least delaying the process. Uh, and it is possible that in the future, unions agree to uh, decertify. However, you need to consider what the cost will be for that, which brings us into the company's response. So despite the fact that you guys do have this massive history of being supportive to your uh, workers and providing these benefits, you are still seeing an enormous amount of negative publicity when it comes to this and backlash as well. So this is a big cost to keep in mind uh, regarding considering your reputation as well as um, your brand. So I will pass it off to Matt to talk a little bit more about the legal aspects of this. Thank you, Paulette. Uh, so while we have prepared an extensive timeline of unionization efforts and litigation at Starbucks, here are some of the events uh, that we highlight uh, in the recent times. In March this year, uh, National Labor Relations Board required Starbucks to post a 13-page notice listing its labor violations and workers' rights in all of its U.S. stores across the country. NLRB even proposed to prohibit businesses from requiring workers to attend meetings that discourages unionization in an attempt to stay ahead of the regulatory curve. Moreover, um, Starbucks will have to head back uh, had to head back to court this April 17th, uh, as Starbucks was accused of 29 unfair labor practice charges and more than 200 violations for uh, uh, violations in uh, in Buffalo County back in la uh, May last year. Given all this series of legal backlashes that the company has been facing, uh, Starbucks has recently appointed on April 13th a new uh, general counsel, that is Patrick Lerman. Now let's talk about Howard Schultz, because Howard Schultz, he's a former CEO of uh, Starbucks, is, has played a predominant role in leading the company in the past two decades. Although he was first hired as the head of marketing in 1982 and then became a CEO in 1987, Star, uh, Howard Schultz has held the position of the CEO of the company three different times, with his most recent uh, tenure lasting from April 2022 to March 2023. He was even subpoenaed by Congress to address the company's response to the unions which was a clear indication that the company's labor practices have come under heavy scrutiny and they need to do more to address these issues. 
Therefore, this year in March 20th, um, on, on March 20th, Lakshman Narsimhan took over the position of Starbucks CEO. His ex past experiences include uh, working at McKinsey for 19 years, working as chief commercial officer at PepsiCo, and even CEO at uh, Record Bank more recently. Narsimhan has made some significant changes to the company's policies, such as encouraging senior leaders to work in stores. Uh, which was a clear indication that Starbucks is taking its um, labor practices more seriously and is committed to making more positive changes. And therefore, we are yet to see how this new CEO uh, is going to implement new policies and take the company forward. Now I'm going to pass it on to uh, Sophia to talk more about consumer demographics. Thanks, Madhav. So in order to make these tailored recommendations, we need to make sure we dive into exactly who your consumers are and how they typically act. So at a glance, your consumers are normally high income with an average annual income of $90,000. In addition, there's a wide consumer age range between the ages of 22 and 60. And lastly, your consumers are very tech savvy. 80% of all orders are mobile pickup orders, which shows that they're on the go with their lifestyles. A large portion of your consumers are millennial and Gen Z. So we've kind of, we've dove in to see some trademark characteristics. These include being very health conscious, focused on sustainability, socially aware and value driven, well educated, tech savvy, normally big spenders, and they have busy lifestyles. Diving in a little deeper, I bring your attention to the dark brown bar on the left. This represents millennials and Gen Z within the range of our consumer age range and they represent 33.78%. With this being the most prominent um, portion of your consumers, we're going to make sure we tailor our recommendations to them. And lastly, we need to look at consumer satisfaction. We've seen a significant dip in consumer satisfaction since 2021. This aligns directly with the unionization efforts at Starbucks. And especially as they've gotten more and more public, it is with, it's hard to avoid this information and it makes you pause and think before su supporting Starbucks with your own money. And now I'm going to pass it off to Paulette to focus more on honoring authenticity and culture. Thank you, Sophia. Hello again. And so we are going to now dive a little bit deeper into our detailed recommendations, which is why we are ultimately here. And we first talk about recommitting to your culture of belonging, which really connects with that importance of honoring authenticity, especially because it's so valued by your consumers, as Sophia alluded to. Um, now, diving into this detailed approach, our thought process was, well, how about we think about it as making a drink? Hence, let's make a drink. So if we want to picture it like this, Starbucks in and of itself is the cup. And if we begin with number one, the beverage, the beverage is the most important part of a drink, right? And that part signifies and symbolizes the culture, that aspect of culture of belonging and authenticity. We then want to enhance it by adding that sweetener, considering that middle ground stance on unionization and how you guys want to approach that. We want to top it off with the whip where we will discuss the four C's that are goal oriented and we'll discuss this by um, implementing a form of um, commitment, communication, consultation, and corroboration. And then finally, prep. This is where we will provide some suggestions for small steps you can take in order to bring forth these new initiatives that will support everything we are talking about today. Now I will pass it off to Fiona. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paulette. So Starbucks has already begun to move towards creating a flourishing culture by appointing a new CEO, a new general counsel, and initiating a third-party review of labor practices, giving the company a good start to begin approaching unionization. To ensure that the company's approach is ethical, Starbucks needs to recommit to honoring authenticity of all by returning to a culture of belonging. With millennials being a critical age group for Starbucks from employees to customers, it is vital that Starbucks live its mission to fruition in its approach to unionization. Keeping in mind that this ethical base for decision-making, Starbucks can navigate the following three options when it comes to approaching unionization. First, Starbucks can continue being on the defensive against unions, and you can make no changes in your approach. Secondly, 
Starbucks can fully embrace unions, which may compromise your culture of belonging and increase costs for your business. Or Starbucks can take the middle way by being respectful to unions and adjusting benefits to meet your partners where they are. I'm now going to pass it off to my colleague, Madhav, to explain the financial and legal elements of this approach. Yes, thank you, Fiona. So the uh, financially, Starbucks has been uh, exhibiting a sustained revenue growth trajectory uh, and has demonstrated a robust profitability of about $3 million uh, in the latest financial year. Uh, Starbucks, although its revenue decreased, uh, increased by 11% in the most, most recent year, its profitability went down slightly. Although it, uh, uh, and it is mainly because of the increase uh, in its corporate and operating loss of over $1.5 billion. Addri the cost of addressing the labor market conditions, uh, the increased employee wages and, and benefits, and other costs related to the attrition of the employees only make up to the fraction of the cost. There might be other reasons why the company must have uh, faced a, a downward trend in its uh, profitability. Now, looking at the impact of the unionization that this might have on Starbucks uh, financials, we have seen that historically unionizations have led to increase in labor costs. They have led to increase in operational costs because uh, both of these have to do with the less flexibility that unionization brings in. And most importantly, it has led to workplace tension that has imp negatively impacted employee morale and productivity at the company. And given that Starbucks number of employees have more than doubled in the past 10 years, this is all the more important to consider when going through this process of unionization. Firstly, we need to make note of the legal risk that the Starbucks that Starbucks has invited in the past couple of years while resisting the unionization efforts. From the historical backlashes and negative rulings that it has re received from NLRB from in 2008 to the uh, most recent statement that uh, NLRB Church Michael Rose has made about Starbucks' way of dealing with employees, which was called as egregious and widespread misconduct. Starbucks has also invited, uh, has been prone to legal scrutiny because of its efforts of resisting unionization, which cannot be called as completely legally compliant because of the way it has fired employees for supporting unions, because of the way it has gone by store closures and the pay disparity policies between union and non-union workers. Moreover, it has also incurred a lot of costs, firstly, in legal costs of changing a general counsel more than thrice in the past two years, and then the outside counsel fees uh, from uh, uh, of, uh, in millions of dollars and the uh, lost revenue of more than $60 million from store closures in the past year, which were termed as security reasons, but were most, uh, were, but for the uh, stores which were, which happened were uh, stores which were closed following unionization. And therefore, we recommend that Starbucks has to, uh, uh, and therefore, we recommend that uh, un uh, communication benefits have. Um, have to be looked upon uh, as a way forward because Starbucks can redirect its focus and resources towards dealing with, uh, dealing with employees in good faith. And it can go over the fair terms and uh, conditions for currently unionized workers. This way they can uh, reduce the, employee, the, the tension that is between the leadership and the employees, and it can overcome the negative effects of, uh, of the unionization. Now I pass it off to uh, Fia. Um, thank you, Mav. I, I will actually yeah. be taking this one on. <laughs> but uh, so this is going back a little bit to the detailed approach that I was telling you all about that would be uh, goal oriented. And this will focus on, like I said, commitment, communication, consultation and corroboration. So to dive a little bit deeper, commitment will be focusing on establishing a people and culture task force to develop new policy and support leadership as you go through this whole process of implementing policy. This will probably be within the first five weeks. Uh, as for communication, this is where you want to develop a public information campaign uh, to inform employees and consumers about this policy change, which will probably happen within the sixth week. For consultations, consultation, I mean, you will set guidelines for the committee that will have employee representation within it, as well as they will provide future input. So you're consulting with your employees that will be within weeks seven to 10. And then finally, with corroboration, this is where you will be implementing listening sessions, review, as well as revision of the policy, 
and promote employee training. And this will be something that will be continuous over time as it will adapt depending on how the company grows and changes as well as how society grows and changes. Like we said, new generation coming into the workforce will continue to happen. So this is where we wanna uh, bring into, into to your attention the new initiatives we had in mind. One of those is to introduce the drink of the day. So we kind of narrow down the amount of times people order those crazy TikTok drinks with a million scoops of whatever. And with that drink of the day, that will be someone comes in, they order one specific drink that they can try out for the TikTok and then they are satisfied, but we narrow it down so baristas aren't overwhelmed. Then we have this aspect of the loyalty program, which goes off of that drink of the day, drink of the day idea. And so now customers, when they come in and they order the TikTok drink, when it comes to the loyalty program, they will get two times the loyalty points to encourage uh, customer engagement. And so that way that um, compensates for whatever money could have been lost for the amount of TikTok drinks others order. Now you encourage that they order one specific TikTok drink. Uh, finally, we go into the profit sharing idea that we have with this. It's all connected, which is where Starbucks can continue to live by its values by returning this profit to their consumers, um, uh, excuse me, not consumers, to their employees, which would be the baristas, uh, through this POS system tracking, um, POS tracking system. So baristas, whenever they make one of these crazy drinks, they also get part of the profit. Now, it's important to note that this is all looped into this respect this culture of respect and understanding. And as we said before, let's take the example of Jen, where this offers this actual set of steps that can address these working and pay conditions concerns that give this idea of, of the company and employees benefiting from both. And now Sophia will take it away to go into more detail. Yes, thank you, Paulette. So here we have an actual example of what it would look like when our consumers open the Starbucks app that they are already using. And they will see exactly right here, this little advertisement promotion that says collect 60 bonus stars for ordering the drink of the day. And it'll give them the description, like for here, it's the TikTok pink drink. Now, what this does is it's streamlining. And we have, we're going to train our baristas how to make this drink. So they were already prepared for to make this TikTok drink of the day. And it also influences our customers to try and buy this TikTok drink because it's right in front of their face as soon as they open the app. This creates incentives for everyone and further creates this culture of belonging. Secondly, we have an in-store option of promotion. With this, we can decorate our blackboards to promote this drink. And I want to draw your attention to the hashtag at the bottom. The importance of this is to encourage our customers to promote and share this on social media so that we're not only just focusing on TikTok, but we're permeating through all social media platforms. In addition, we're going to empower our baristas to make these drinks because they now have a desire as they're getting some profit kickback. I would like to now pass it on to Madhav to sweeten the deal for us. So as we can see from the graph, uh, beverages constitute for majority of the Starbucks revenue. And therefore, it is certainly it certainly sweetens the deal because uh, beverages are uh, this all these unicorn and customized drinks are popular with Gen Zs and millennials, and therefore our recommendation will certainly uh, positively benefit Starbucks in terms of revenue, and while also continuing to provide this experience to its customers. Now I pass it on to Fian. Great, thank you so much, Mata. Next slide. To serve our final recommendation once again and provide your team with an actionable plan, we recommend leveraging your change in leadership to take the middle way to unionization, meeting partners where they are to provide the benefits they need to succeed. In order to do this, Starbucks must reiterate its culture of belonging by living its mission. This means truly embracing employees as partners by holding listening sessions centered around the four C's that lead to changes in benefits in a flourishing workplace. Starbucks can, be, can begin implementing some of these recommendations to immediately foster a culture of belonging by introducing drink of the day, enhanced loyalty programs, and profit sharing. Why? Because success is better when it's shared. Thank you. And we are now open for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. So you are in my playground, literally. And I think you need to close the... Um, 
uh, the screen share at this point. Okay. You can do that. Okay, so you are in my playground. So I have a question for you. When you pointed out that there is no collective bargaining agreement yet, did you know that it's very common because these are complicated agreements for the process of negotiation to actually go on for a year or more? Yes, I can, yes. I'm nodding. You have to yes. say yes. Yes, yes, yes. They, they, they do, they do we, take a long before time. Before we tell you that you have to speak because otherwise it's not part of the record. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, thank the, you the, the answer is yes. For that one. Yeah. Now you pointed out that there are multiple stores, whoops, who that have chosen to unionize already. And there is a, a concept in labor union work lately of the micro unit. In other words, discovering that um, one group of five or more people forms one union and they go under the Teamsters, the next one go under the retail workers union. Um, and you can have actually, I always say that in South Fifth Avenue, the shoe department has its own zip code and could have its own labor union. So um, has that happened at Starbucks or has all the unionization taken place under um, one particular, um, one particular um, umbrella union? Yeah, I can start this off, and then if any other one of my teammates wants Great. to also add on, more than happy. Um, in terms of what we what we know, a lot of the unionization um, starts originally in the stores and is typically led by Gen Zers and Millennials, um, mm -hmm. as Sophia was talking about in the presentation. Yeah. One of the things that is commonly happening is that a lot of these unionization efforts are being uh, bolstered by the Starbucks Workers United uh, Union itself. Uh -huh. Their logo was somewhere in our presentation on the bottom right-hand corner. Thanks, Paulette, for the design. Um, but yes, to answer your question, it's mm -hmm. usually within Starbucks Workers United that a lot of these protests are happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. And because uh, you noted the cost per year per worker of unionization, this is fascinating because I'm giving a, a speech where I'm doing, it's almost like a presidential debate with the head of the union uh, in two weeks uh, here in New York at the Bar Association. And does it have to be a, an adversarial relationship? Have you found that in different parts of the country or in different circumstances that the feelings about Starbucks um, and loyalty to Starbucks is different than in others? And if so, on what basis? Um, I can take this one too. And if anybody wants to add as well, there hasn't really seemed to be this big difference in the way people feel. I guess the only difference would be like with Sophia talking about um, that one particular store that couldn't take shelter, even though there was a, there was a tornado mm -hmm. outside. Um, that has to do with the specific geo, the location that they're in. They were probably somewhere in Texas, Oklahoma, or so and so forth in that area. Um, uh, you probably wouldn't have the same thing happen in New York. But what has what we have seen continue being this very common thing between unions is that aspect of pay and work conditions. And work conditions mm -hmm. can either be, like we said, that example of the tornado. It could also be really, really long work hours. It can be that, for example, there was another really sad comment on there that we that we showcased where a woman had a miscarriage and her boss still made her work. So, so are just, we selecting star? I find a lot that in like mid-level management. To then lay the, the onus for, um, you know, somebody low down the totem pole who doesn't get it on an entire corporation and use that as a, uh, as a clarion call for unionization. I'm sorry, Ruth, you cut out for me for a little bit. Would oh, you I'm sorry. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Thank so you. what I'm saying is we find a lot that low level people in management, assistant managers are not well trained and yeah. may make judgment calls that it's poor judgment. Should that be a clarion call for unionization across the exception as opposed to a rule? I'm sorry, you cut out yeah. <laughs> again. You cut out again, so right when you said the poor thing. Oh my goodness. You keep, you keep cutting out. Do you think you want to oh wait God. and try right. in a few this minutes? Is such, yes. such is technology. So my concern is if somebody in low level management makes a poor judgment call, right? Or they're just not, uh, you know, 
socially aware. Mm -hmm. Do we make that the class as the board? Do we make that the clarion call um, for how we should respond to unionization? Or is this the call to train our management better to be respect, uh, respectful interpersonally? I mean, is the union mm -hmm. using these anecdotal examples as the basis to basically manipulate the workers into signing up? I wouldn't say that it has become something of a, well, I don't know, Fiona, it looked like you were gonna add something. Did you wanna go first? No, go for it and I'll, I'll add on. It seems like um, it hasn't really been a, a thing of manipulation. If anything, sometimes because of what has been passed out with um, how the company is kind of going against that anti-union aspect, a lot of employees are thinking very toughly about whether or not they want to uh, unionize. So, And we are seeing that sometimes people are voting for the union and actually the union, the non-union vote actually takes is, is wins. So it's not necessarily that it's it's a it's a cultivation of everything put together. It's not like one one thing happens that was not very nice, and then from there it just explodes. And they're like, let's just make a union. It's it's more of the saying that like little things happen over time that just amount to someone to like multiple people within that location wanting to unionize. You bring up a great point, however, in regards to the training, which is why we really wanted to bring yeah, in, you're, in our four C's. We, we talked about it in corroboration where we said we promote training and that wouldn't just necessarily mean promote tr more training for baristas in how to make those crazy TikTok drinks. It's, it's also that training of managers and how to approach it and how to continue promoting that culture of belonging. That's a, that was a big, yeah. that was a big point of that. Yeah. One more question: Are any of the Star are any of the Starbucks stores uh, franchises, as opposed to all corporate owned? There, are, there are some. There are some franchises in Starbucks. Okay, good to know. And how has there been a distinction between the franchise situations in terms of unionization versus the company owned stores? No, not particularly. No. Not okay. that we have seen. All right, Leon, do you have questions? Oh, go I ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, go so, ahead. Hi. Um, th thanks for that. So, super engaging. We'll give the other feedback later. I have a couple questions. One, I guess what I would be interested in is could, and I'll do two things if you can remember both of them. Great. Could you all restate the ethical issue we're trying to solve here? And that would be super helpful. And then secondly, I think that you said, as you talked about the three options, option two, which is where you landed around sort of embracing the unions. I think somebody made a comment that that might compromise the culture of belonging that is so important here. And so I I'd just like to understand both of those things. They're not the they're not one after another, but I got the floor. I'll ask two questions. Um, I'm happy to take this on. I think I might be able to hit both of them. So. Our ethical question in this presentation is regarding this idea of the ethical principle of flourishing. So when it comes to flourishing, it's making sure that a company is supporting its employees both as professionals and as people. Currently, Starbucks does a pretty good job at providing benefits that support employees as people. They offer health benefits, they offer educational benefits, they offer a wide variety of support benefits, including paid medical leave, paid um, mental health insurance, things like that. Um, however, what they are currently lacking is support in terms of professionals. Um, a lot of these individuals specifically, like we used in our presentation, Jen, have other additional adventures and endeavors that they're looking to fund in their lives and their minimum wage at Starbucks is simply not enough, which has been a rising cause for uh, this fight towards the, uh, the tussle for $20 per hour. Um, as it relates to unions and the ethical question regarding this, we believe that unions in this situation might cause more harm than good to the situation at Starbucks. Right now, we have a firm understanding that Starbucks is struggling with this element of giving professionals at their organization the right benefits um, because there hasn't been enough listening or because there hasn't been a receptive middle management that has been able to actually tell those top level executives what, the, um, what these partners actually are looking for. And so when it comes to incorporating a union and all of that, there could be this lack of flexibility coming from a collective bargaining agreement that could then prevent and compromise that level of communication that could instead be fostered through four C's corroboration, commitment approach and listening sessions. I hope that that makes a little Super bit Super helpful. Sense. Thank you very much. Of course. Yeah, happy to help. Uh, 
I mean, do you have more questions? Yeah, I do, but we have two other judges, so I want to let them have time. Oh, okay. Okay. Leon? Leon, we're not hearing you. Oh, no, he's not muted. So maybe it's the technology. Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. It's my technology. <laughs> um, you you addressed a little bit. I don't know if you can say more. I mean, Starbucks was known as a fair employer. One of the reasons it was successful in the beginning, because everybody saw it as really this nice place. That's gone away. What suggestions might you have that would help us get back our reputation, both for the public and for employees? How do you may how do you get them to trust the organization again? My other question is more in terms of I don't know if you've ever heard of the term uh, uh, evolving technology. It's not about someone develops something new as technology. It's that when somebody does something, everybody else thinks of ways around it or to use it in ways never thought of. And in terms of your TikTok drink and how you're going to do it, one of the problems, it seems to me, is if you're going to pay the barista who makes it more or make them share in the profits, how do you prevent them from cheating on each other? So that one tries to get more of the caseload than anybody else. How do you make it so they all view that they've been treated fairly on this app as it, as workload is assigned? I am happy to take that second one. Um, and then, Sophia, I'd love for you to answer the first one that you mentioned. So in terms of the second one here, um, one of the ways that you can kind of ensure that this evolution of technology is taken into account, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the aspect of there's this big company called Toast. And one of the things that they did over COVID was ensure that they could have handheld um, POS systems that could go over around to tables and minimize the amount of interaction between um, the server and the customer. It helped to make sure that there was less like COVID interaction. We can incorporate this and help to mitigate that evolution of technology by ensuring that every single time a barista is in charge of taking an order, they are using their specific toast system in order to take that order. And that toast system is then tracking that it was actually that barista who was taking that order so that the profits can pop can um, so that the profits can properly be assigned to them. Okay, but my issue is yeah. how do you make sure that one barista doesn't run up and take all the orders? Mm -hmm. So it's always on their POS and they get 50% of the orders that day and the other five baristas have to divide the other 50%. Mm -hmm. Typically the way, oh, no, probably you go. Oh, no, that, that's okay, Fiona. You can finish your sentence and then I'll, I'll add to you. Um, so at, at many Starbucks companies, um, typically like you'll see kind of this pat back and forth between people that take the orders and people that actually make the drinks. Um, what we're recommending and also to hopefully encourage a lack of burnout during the course of a shift is that employees will take the order and then begin making the order themselves. So there'd be kind of like this rotation to ensure that there's not this burnout of like, I've been making TikTok drinks for the last five hours, like my hands are going to fall off. Um, Paula, anything else that you want to add to that? Yeah, you do bring up a great point in the sense that uh, that worrisome of, of competition because competition then sometimes can become a little bit toxic when it comes to culture. So the fact that we're talking about culture today, it's important to acknowledge what you mentioned in, in competition not becoming toxic. Uh, what we wanna offer is this opportunity for the TikTok train to not become this massive monster, but for it to become something that could be of an opportunity for them. And as you said that there could be this aspect of competition, however, it's about the way we go about it. And um, I think partially that will also come down to the type of culture Starbucks develops amongst their employees. And if they are creating a competitive atmosphere that is not cutthroat, it can actually be quite healthy. And like Fiona said, it's kind of this aspect of going back and forth. If if someone's getting really if making TikTok things, TikTok drinks can be very exhausting. So it also creates that aspect of when someone makes one, they'll probably be exhausted afterwards. And maybe someone will come back and right after the person is starting to make that TikTok drink, someone else comes in and orders another TikTok drink. So if that person is occupied making one TikTok drink, someone else is going to have to go and, and help the other person. So there will eventually be this back and forth. And if we we do see that this rise of toxic um, competition does come up, we can take actionable steps. Like I said, going back to the four C's, when we talk about corroboration, we talk about going back and reviewing the policy constantly as the company grows. And so that also takes a big part into it. 
the whatever it is that you implement when you go into a new policy change, you will start seeing different consequences that you may not have considered. So that is why that aspect of reviewing and revision helps to kind of combat that. So then you have this cushion to fall on in case something um, something arises that you weren't expecting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Um, I want to circle back to your first question. So with the trusting of the brand, so the distrust came from millennials and Gen Z. And what we have found is that they really honor transparency. And so what is important for Starbucks is to kind of like acknowledge that they've steered off of their path of the culture of belonging. And they're getting back on track by taking our recommendation of being respectful of these unions and having listening sessions. So with that, we're regaining the trust back of these millennials and Gen Z. Um, and additionally, a lot of the way that this distrust kind of spread was through social media and through the comments we brought up. As one employee shares their bad experience, it kind of creates a snowball effect of everyone sharing their bad experiences. And this just promotes a lot of negative um, cultural comments. So as we return back to the culture of belonging, we hope to see employees enjoying their job again and less negative comments so that we rebuild the trust in our brand um, and inviting our customers to come back by supporting by supporting this generation through the way that they like to be supported. Thank you. Isn't fundamentally though, I mean, all this stuff is important. Obviously transparency, people feeling good about the workplace, trusting your employer. But if ultimately the issues are around pay and benefits and working conditions. Um, should we not dance around those? So, I mean, I think your solution that you're suggesting us embrace, which is embrace the unions, but also supplement that with the four C's you talked about, the communication, collaboration, all that, all that stuff, so that we go about the, allow the unionization to go forward. Employees seem to want it in a way that feels good to the company and to the employees. Does that sound right? Or the partners, I guess they're called. Um, is, is that right? But I mean, I think fundamentally the issue is not TikTok drinks, right? Fundamentally the issue, we're not getting paid enough. We don't have good enough benefits or working conditions. They're making us work too many hours or the wrong hours or whatever. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I'd like to, not to clarify, but also just to kind of add on to that. Um, I think the other kind of element to this is like, yes, like the issue is not like TikTok drink. The issue is with like these, this labor and like the fact that like it's just not like they're not being paid enough they're not having this the right workplace environment in order to meet these conditions um and i think what is really important to recognize here is that if starbucks sets the standard of letting unionization happen then the entire service industry kind of sees them as a change maker the same way as they've been seen as a change maker in terms of healthcare insurance a couple of years back um, when they were a first mover in this generation too in terms of how this relates to unionization this is correlated because if Starbucks lets unionization happen, then it tells all of service industry that we, it tells all the rest of the laborers in service industry that things won't improve for them unless they unionize, unless they protest. It helps, it changes this idea of the corporation and it makes it a little bit more divisive where employees feel like they constantly have to be fighting in order to get what they want. What we want Starbucks to do is we want them to be a leader in this landscape and showcase to other service employers that if you sit and you listen to your partners, if you truly see them as partners, these employees, then change can happen without the mechanism of the union and without potentially that divisive um, force coming in between the partner and the corporation. To add to what Fiona was also saying is that you did, you did mention the aspect of embracing unions. However, what we're really wanting to mainly focus on is that aspect of respecting unions. So it's not necessarily that Starbucks completely does a 180 and goes from anti-union to super union. It's more in that sense of like finding that middle way of where you will have this respectful aspect of like Fiona said, you open up this kind of space where you can listen to each other and where it can be respected. And then as you improve your culture and as people see that, hey, Starbucks is making this shift and is providing and is showing these, is addressing our concerns, like you mentioned with pay and um, work conditions, then that aspect of wanting to unionize will start to decline. That is what we are expecting at least. Is it possible that it will decline given the fact that the NLRB and this administration is making such a substantial push toward unionization? They have started to make a big push mainly because of the actions the Starbucks started taking. 
uh, when when it came to the anti-union actions that they were considering. And so that was where we saw that big push with the NLRB with, with that. So I mean, do you think so that the, was limited to Starbucks or was it a systemic thing that this administration wants to view everyone as potentially unionizable to avoid this independent contractor um, set of issues that's, that are arising in many businesses? Manoff, would you like to add for this one since you, you focused on the NLRB legal stuff? Yeah, um, for sure. Uh, I, I I think it's it it, it is certainly the uh, the, the constant. Uh, I think we, we've mentioned that historically uh, since two thousand eight and even now, like there have been multiple attempts at unionization, and the way Starbucks has resisted, like uh, to all its point, uh, it has certainly. Um, invited more legal scrutiny rather than uh, solving this uh, issue amicably with the employees and negotiating the, uh, the deal. And therefore, uh, the certain tactics that, that they have applied in terms of like uh, store closures or firing employees, it has been one of the uh, like uh, uh, major backlash that uh, Starbucks has received legally mm -hmm. because uh, and, and it has uh, it made it easier for NLRB to uh, sort of uh, bring charges against Starbucks for doing that, uh, which uh, is through, uh, based on our recommendations is something that might is not the right approach and they can go for uh, a better path. That answers your question. Uh, as a, as a board. Know, yeah, just so you know, it's breaking news today that the NLRB is detailing harsh remedies against employers who have repeated labor law violations, uh, including failure to issue wage notices, um, refusing to let members of the board and their representatives inspect their facilities, um, and making unionization difficult. So that's as of this afternoon, by the way, out of the NLRB, so you're very timely. As a, as a as a board member, if you, if if I might, real quick, Ruth, or are we done? Absolutely, and then we should really do the um, feedback. So, as, as a board member, and I know you all have presented some financial stuff. Um, certainly, I think twenty twenty one twenty two. There's probably more complexity than just the attempts at unionization that affect profits, obviously. Um, but my CFO tells me that if if we were to unionize our entire shop. It's, I'm going to make up a number. This isn't real, right? It's going to cost us, you know, 40 gazillion dollars. And, you know, people are already paying $6 for a cup of coffee and they don't want to pay any more. So, I mean, this is a real concern. And in my fiduciary responsibility as a board member, I'm not sure I can just so willy nilly sign up to, to, to support all the unionization efforts without a plan for how are we going to address the cost of it? That's just where my head's at. But that's a board member. Yeah. Yeah. I, I I would like to add a couple of thoughts here. Uh, number one, I think the product has evolved with Starbucks. Starbucks product was one of customer service. And because the cost, the food cost was so low and people would go in there and Leon kind of touched upon this point. That product and that business model is 40 or 50 years old and it's outdated. And you can do unionization, you can do all these other things here, but they have lost their way. This is not unionization, unless if, if you want to take on the unions, what you've got to do is give everybody the same thing that you're giving the unions and, and put this thing to bed. But the reality is this, you're going to have to go in there and you're going to have to see your employees as investing their time. What makes that time worthwhile for Gen Z? That's what they want. And I think the thing about it is this is where Starbucks has lost its way. If it's fighting out here with the unions and the National League, forget it. You know, that's a waste of time. The reality of the situation is that the fast food organizations that are going to excel in this next century are the in and outs and the, the outbacks because they are designed for maximizing the employee's investment in their time there. And there's, a, there's things that, that, that Starbucks can do, but they're not, they're not looking at that. They're, they're trying to fight this thing out here with forget it. You know, you've got to go in there and you've got to revamp your business model. You've got to restructure yourself and bring it up to date. So that people that come to work there see it as more than just a paycheck. It's an investment of their time. How are you growing? How are you developing those middle managers? Where, where's your management training? And I know we're out of time, so I can't talk anymore. But those are my thoughts. Is there is there any way I can respond to that? Sure. Sure. Um, I think that I, you make an excellent point. And I think I'd, I want to just make very clear that our recommendation here today was not to like 
fully embrace unions. Our recommendation yeah. here was to treat unions as if they are conglomerates of employees. They are partners to speak to mm -hmm. employees as a whole. In terms of what Starbucks can be doing moving forward in order to like reinvigorate their business model, you are correct. The benefits that they are offering are based off of a model that is 40 years old. These are not the same right. kind of things that encourage and invigorate young people to go and work at a company and actually make an investment in their time. What Starbucks needs to do is understand what are the relevant benefits that these millennials and these Gen Zs are actually going to see as a valuable investment of their time. Exactly. And understand that until they go to a listening session, until these top level executives and these middle managers are forced to listen. If this yes. tone at the top is saying like we need to listen to our employees, we need to see them as partners. And that <laughs> is the first step forward that we can take to ensure that these benefits are actually relevant to our current workforce. But I, I think that gets off track pretty soon, you know, because the employees are going to be so centered on on their issues, they don't see the whole picture. And I think the thing about it with the unionization for fast food operation, it's a dead end. You're going to have to change your business model. You're have to going to go back there. If the unions come in, make everybody pay everybody the same. You pay the unions or else. And but basically, the in and out example is perfect. Profit sharing. Uh, an in and out manager makes one hundred eighty thousand a year. Manager at McDonald's makes 40000 Why is that? Well, it's because they've set up a business model that rewards in uh, production. You get in high wages and things for Starbucks. with a, mm, you, 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 It's going to be a long road. Good point. Excellent. Okay. So let me just tell you, this was a surprise. I've been a lawyer for 45 years. I am in the trenches. I've been in unions. Um, and I'm generally a management side lawyer, but I think you did a beautiful job of illustrating not only the legal and the ethical, um, and the, certainly did very well in the financial dynamic, but also the human dynamic. Human capital is at the basis of, of our corporations. And when a company forgets about the human, the humanness of that part of its operation, um, things can really go astray, especially when they represent themselves or hold themselves out as being, um, you know, caring about their workers, but it, but it's all lip service. And I think you detailed some, you gave a lot of data. This was a very data-driven presentation uh, to my mind. You are all very, very strong um, advocates. You've, pres you've prepared very hard for this. There is no doubt. Your, your professor should be should be grinning from ear to ear at this point, right? You're very, I know how proud you must be of them. You, you did a superb job. Um, and this is a subject matter that is not a simple problem, to be honest with you. And, and you know, in this competition, um, sometimes we see teams that do a beautiful job at very simplistic issues. And the labor management conundrum, coupled with the profit issues, coupled with, um, just the general, uh, the notion of the union as opposed to the worker and the and the employer, but suddenly the third party intervener, if you will, is a very complicated um, area um, for consideration. And I thought you did a fantastic job. Congratulations. I don't say that too often. I'm I'm pretty tough, and I was yeah. I was at 21 years of this. I'm fundamentally um, impressed with with you as a group. Um, and I wish you a lot of luck tomorrow in the uh, 10 minutes and the 90 seconds. I thought you did great. Yeah, I just like to add, I think you've given the best solution for what's out in front of you. I'm kind of looking long term as to what really needs to happen for these companies. And I think that given what, you know, what you what you can work with there, I think, yeah, I would agree with your your recommendations. But I think that the industry, the fast food industry is is headed for a cliff, I think if it doesn't change its business models. Uh, I, I want and, and again, a good presentation. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, fantastic presentation. And the way you framed everything through Starbucks eyes, starting with your favorite drink, by the way, if you do work at Starbucks, if any of you did, that's exactly what they do in meetings. So good for you. Um, you know, really well, well presented. You were each very well prepared. And um, I, I want to compliment you on it. As you think about your 10 minute and your 90 second, I actually think the way you answered some of the questions at the end to punch out what are the ethical issues and this is our solution. Think about maybe bringing that in earlier 
and more punchier because I think that was like, oh, okay. I, I, if I'd heard that earlier, the rest of it, um, I, it would have resonated differently earlier on. So, but super well done. Okay, good luck tomorrow. Go UMass. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I would add too that I thought it was a super job and very engaging and a very good use of slides. I would echo though what Bobby said about punching out some of that stuff and with a short presentation it's really a matter of this is why you asked us here this is the problem and why it's a problem so especially relating to their uh, culture you know you said this this is reality the world watches what you do not what you say here's our recommendation to change what you do so it can see can so it coincides with what you say Thank you. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank Congratulations you. Congratulations to all of you. Good luck do, tomorrow. Do, do you guys have any questions for us or anything you want to revise? Because certainly we're here to help too, because we're super supportive of this whole thing. Oh, that's so sweet. Thank you. Um, <laughs> first, yeah. First off, thank you so much. Um, I think my my question for you, like now that we're, we're out of the um, are we are we out of the feed? Okay, solid. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> I was just curious to know. I think like in terms of like bringing in the ethics earlier, do you feel like the question like wasn't ethically focused enough or it was just like dancing around it? I'm worried that like our recommendation wasn't clear enough or our question wasn't clear. I, I think when you do the 30, you know, the short, the long presentation, when you're dealing with HR issues, it is inherently, you know, it just intrinsically based in in ethics yeah. that's at least my opinion about it i think obviously in the 10 minute and certainly in the 90 second you don't have a choice that's all you're going to be focusing on right and it'll be easier for you then not to have that question right because it will only be on the ethics of the of the employer employee relationship and and whether the employer is trying to subvert the employees and the exercise of the right to collective action because that's you know that's the essence um Every employee handbook I write has in mul on multiple pages, and there was a point where the NLRB in New York, like I know the district director, wanted actually every page at the top in red to say nothing contained herein shall limit the ability of employees to engage in collective action. And that is the large, frankly, ethical question, not just the finance question of do employees have the right to participate, to share information, and to come together as a collective to state their desires as opposed to the little David and Goliath. And that's the, right. you know, that's that's the core of um, frankly the mission of the NLRB these days um, is to make sure that people have the feeling that they can join together without the fear of retaliation. I, I, um, I, I mean I agree with oh go ahead, Leon. No, I thank you. I was gonna say the, the ethical issue that you have to focus on is the one you've sort of gone around and alluded to all the time, is this is what you said, and this is what you do, and they have to come together. You can either stop saying it. I remember being reviewed by the uh, federal government over accessibility, and we had a sign in the hospital that said something was accessible and it wasn't. And I said, the easiest solution is take the sign down. <laughs> yeah. So either they stop saying it, or they start doing what they said. And in the yeah. short presentation, you can get into a long discussion about the law and and the right to unionize or whatever. But this, for me at least, the essence of this is you say you're going to do this to your employees. The fact they want to unionize suggests you're not doing it. Here's the gap that we found. And here's our solution to close that gap. And then in some ways, unionizing doesn't become the issue anymore. Yeah, that's right. I, right. I agree. I agree with Leon, and I, I, I don't. I, yes, Ruth, I think HR issues are inherently ethical issues. But since this is an ethics case competition, I think by you coming out and saying something along the lines that Leon said, or even what you had said, Fiona, um, at the end, which is that the fundamental challenge is flourishing, the company flourishing, employees right. flourishing, and the trust that goes in between all those, and how do we do that in a way that's that's responsible to all parties involved. That's the right. ethical issue here. Right. Uh, and, I, I and, think you should say, I think honestly, it doesn't hurt for you, especially in the shorter one to, to punch that right out. My personal right, opinion. But. Right. And that the one uh, thing I would really encourage you to punch out is you, you uh, alluded to the fact that the middle managers are not getting, are not getting well prepared. 
that's critical because you grow experience, you grow investment, you grow their learning, their growth, and that attracts people into the company, but it also does that. And you brought that point out. I would punch that up a little bit. <clears throat> I have a quick well question. Well done, well done. I really Thank enjoyed you. it. Go ahead, Paul. I'm in, yeah. This is my thing, hotel, restaurant. So you did a really good job. Yes. Um, I'm, I'll be doing the 90 second. And my question was, because I talked about this with um, Professor Merton as well. And it was, since we're playing the role of an employee, or I would be playing the role of an employee, uh, would it be, the, my, the game plan so far is to be kind of an employee at Starbucks corporate, and then to allude to like my friend, Jen, who we had often come up with in our presentation as an example. Uh, so I get both sides. Or would it just be more effective to be a barista myself? I, my personal view, I did some work for Starbucks over the years and definitely the corporate employee perspective is different than the, you know, the rank and file. And if you probably look at numbers of, of team members, whatever they're called, <laughs> partners, you know, it's probably like 80, 20, right. And, and, mm -hmm. and, and so I think it's probably more straightforward to be Jen, to be Jen or someone like, Jen. I think so too. 90 uh, seconds. I agree at 90 seconds. You're basically saying, hi, I'm Jen. I, maybe I came here because I thought the company was X, Y, Z and really good. This is my experience. It doesn't match what you say. These are our suggestions to get us back where we were. And I think yeah. that's a great Thank approach you, to do it as a personal as, as in a personal experience because it is a human experience as Ruth said earlier. Yeah. Yep. Well, that's Absolutely. a great great idea. Well, we, good idea. Okay. Good to know. Thank you. So we we wish you the best of luck tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. So of luck. Thank you all for a yeah. fantastic Congratulations. Well done. Presentation. Yes. Well Thank done. you, you all nice. very much. Absolutely bye -bye. fantastic. Have bye. a great day. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.